The worst experience I had with the 88s, they started shelling us and I didn't have time to dig a foxhole. I just had to drop down on the ground and hope that the shrapnel wouldn't get me. And something hit my arm and it went numb. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor, a once silent and indifferent America was now unanimously invested in a victorious end of the Second World War. Whether driven by world justice or a desire to see their troops come home safely, Americans of all ages and backgrounds were fully engaged in the war effort. I'm Gus H. Miller, Jr. Uh, just like everybody else, you know, the war was needed to be won and we all wanted to go. I graduated from high school in 1943, and, and I was drafted in 1944. It wasn't very long after that, it was off to the races. <laughs> they put us on a troop train and we went to uh, Camp Hood. I took my 17 weeks of basic training there. You had to learn how to shoot rifles, you had to learn how to shoot pistols, you had to learn how to shoot machine guns. And I was in an anti-tank platoon on 57 millimeter, we learned very quickly how to maneuver where we could shoot the 57 millimeter every five seconds. I joined the 97th Division at Camp Cook, California. Three, four days later, we got on a troop train and went all the way across the United States to Camp Kilburn, New Jersey. That's the port of embarkation. And so they put us on a ship and off we went. The 97th Division was sent directly to the European theater to reinforce the heavy American losses sustained in the Battle of the Bulge and stop German forces from staging another surprise attack. Gus and the fresh soldiers of the 97th were sent straight to the front lines. And we went on to Lahore, France. Of course, it was all bombed out and, and we went to a French train and they put us on boxcars. They were going to take us up to where the German lines were, which was at that time on the west side of the Rhine River. They hadn't crossed the Rhine River yet. And we had to walk from then on. We could already hear explosions up in the front. It became nighttime. Now we're up there to where the German soldiers could cross the Rhine River and, and come in and, and get us all messed up. And we pulled our unit in, inside of a, a wall. Now it's time for us to pull guard duty. The Germans, when they were walking outside, would have hobnail boots and you could kind of hear them clump, clump, clump. So I was out there by myself and I heard them. And they're on one side of the, the fence and I'm on the other. And I had my rifle and I knew that if they opened that gate, I was gonna to have to start shooting them. And they walked right by that gate. Then I knew where they were going, that we had a machine gun nest up the road. So one very long later, well, they opened up and killed all of them. But that was our, my first experience with combat. And it wasn't very pleasant to know that you're outnumbered, but you learn to handle yourself, or if you don't, well, you're not gonna live. On April 3rd, 1945, the 97th crossed over the Rhine River to meet their German foes head on. Though thousands of German troops acknowledged defeat and readily surrendered, Gus found that many were determined to fight on to the very end. We were to encircle the Ruhr Valley itself. And so British Army was in the north coming down. And of course, the first army was on the move across the river and going north. And we encircled them when it was about 
350, 400,000 German troops cut off. And of course, they wanted to fight like everything to get out. We just didn't want anything to do with those Tiger tanks because 57 millimeters were just like a pea shooter. And we'd shoot the armor piercing at it, and it'd just bounce off. Other than that, we were running like a jackrabbit. We wanted to get out of there. You don't want to have anything to do with it because they could just run over us. When you see the Tiger coming, and say, it's time to leave. <laughs> The 88s were extremely good when they would zero in on you. So we couldn't stay in one place but just a few seconds. So we'd fire maybe two, maybe three rounds. We'd hook off and man, we were gone. We just had to do that over and over and over and over. The worst experience I had with the 88s, they started shelling us and I didn't have time to dig a foxhole. I just had to drop down on the ground and hope that the shrapnel wouldn't get me. The concussion would be so great that it'd blow your helmet off your head if you didn't hold it down. So you'd get down and hold it like this. And something hit my arm and it went numb. And I thought, oh dang, I said, I guess the shrapnel's hit my arm and it's probably not even there anymore. I finally got enough gumption to turn my head and look to see it. It was still there. <laughs> what it was, a rocket hit me and it's right on your funny bone, you know, where it sends, you know, that needles down your arm. So I got ready to get up and there was a soldier closer than I am to you on his stomach but he was dead. It killed him. Somewhere around Solingen, Germany, we came to a roadblock. Lieutenant Harrington said, go out and take all the logs off and so we can keep going. And I walked over to him and I said, Lieutenant Harrington, we don't want to go any further. The line soldiers hadn't even got here yet. We're gonna be behind the German lines if we go through here. And he said, I don't give, this is what I want to do and this is what we're gonna do. So, so off we went. I was very uncomfortable because I knew where we were getting deeper and deeper and the Americans were not even here. There was a little town and we had to drive right through the middle of it. And there were the German soldiers were walking up and down and they were surprised to see us. I mean, they didn't have any idea that we would even be there. And they started shooting at us and we started shooting at them and we had to drive through. But now how are we going to get back? We can't turn around, we have to go back through them. So we just kept going. And we got several miles out and we saw a farmhouse way off on the side, and so we went up to that farmhouse, and we got in the basement of that thing and stayed there for three days. And the Germans were running up and down the roads, and we didn't know what in the world they were gonna capture us or what. They didn't know where we were. And all of a sudden, I saw movement. I thought, oh my goodness, the Germans coming in by foot. So I got all ready and I, and I kept watching and watching. And I said, that's American soldiers. <laughs> they came up and it was K Company of our battalion. And they said, what you guys doing here? We said, we've been praying you'd get here. <laughs> and we got back and they already thought we'd been captured. And they were getting ready to send notices back to the United States that we were missing in action. Uh, and I just thought, oh, I'm so glad we, you haven't sent that out because I think my mother would have a croak if, you know, just if something happened like that. And so she never did know anything about it. In fewer than two months overseas, Gus experienced more close combat than most men would see throughout the entire war. 
But all of this would pale in comparison to some of the worst attributes of Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany. Hitler youth were in so indoctrinated. You take the little 13 year old boy you got here. He was, would be so indoctrinated that if the two y'all were talking and it would be a, what he was not taught to, to learn, he would turn you in. And that's how they were. And then when they got to the point where we were overrunning in, in the city, well, these Hitler youth were trying to, to fight back. And of course, we had to kill some of them because they were shooting at us. And that's not very much fun to shoot anybody anytime, but then it's, it's sad to have to shoot a kid. So if you look over there and you see them looking at you and getting ready to shoot, you, what you gonna do? Then the 97th Division was transferred to the 3rd Army, which was General George Patton's army. And we were to push the Germans all the way across Germany. Went through Würzburg, through Bamberg, and got to the Czechoslovakian border. But before we got there, we came into a concentration camp. Flossenburg concentration camp. The German soldiers had already abandoned it and had run and left those poor, pitiful people that were just starved to death and they looked like, you can't believe, you've seen pictures of them, but just looking at a picture is not like seeing them in, in the flesh. How sad everybody was to see people that could be, still be alive and be like this. They were so weak, some of them died right there, right in front of us. As Gus stood taking in the horrors that surrounded him, one of the nearby prisoners caught his eye. And he could talk English fairly good. And so he was explaining to me all of this. He lived in, in, in Amsterdam. And when the Germans came into Amsterdam, well, they threw him in the back of a, of a truck. And in front of him, they shot his mother, they shot his father, shot his sister and set fire to their home and, and they put him in a concentration camp. He stayed in there from 1940 to 1945. And I said, how in the world have you been able to handle yourself for five years when you knew that your whole family was murdered? And he said, well, I tried to, to make myself think that I'm going to go back someday and I want to live in Amsterdam. I said, well, what are you going to do right now? I said, I'm, I'm right here in Flossenburg and I'm going to walk back. And he left and I could see him walking on away. Now, and I still think it with his attitude that he got back. I just always felt like he got back. On April 30th, 1945, as the Red Army closed in on his bunker in Berlin, Adolf Hitler took his own life. A week later, the war in Europe came to an end. Gus and the 97th Infantry Division were reassigned to the Pacific Theater to prepare for the upcoming invasion of Japan. But before they could reach their destination, Japan surrendered. The Second World War was over, but Gus would carry it with him for some time to come. I'd start having this nightmare, and the nightmare was that I had a hand grenade that I was trying to get rid of, and it was spewing, and in four seconds it's going to explode, and it was stuck under my ring, and I couldn't get it off and I would sit up in bed and I was wringing wet. And it'd make you think, I'm not gonna wear a ring to have that nightmare come back. So I, I, I never did wear any rings from then on, I, and it went away. 
and I never have done it since. When Margaret and I married, she wanted to have a double ring ceremony, and I says, no, someday I'll tell you why. War is a nasty thing. But we thought, well, if we gotta go, we gotta go. We gotta get this thing over with. So we were ready to go. It wasn't, oh shoot, now, it wasn't anything like that. It's just, it's different. The people today, it, it's, it's, it's not the same. If, if your country was going down the, the tube, you're going to rise up and you're going to do everything you can to keep your country from that happening. It was wholeheartedly everybody. The people were really wanting to do everything they could to, to help. That's the difference between now and then. And I'm not so sure, sure that we would be like that today. I'm hoping that we would be if that would ever happen. I don't hope it's never going to happen to us. But we don't know. everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you for watching this episode. Our goal is to capture as many World War II veteran stories as we can from all over the world, but we can't do it alone. If you'd like to help us in this mission, consider supporting us through Patreon, and check out our website, memoirsofworldwar2.com, for more information. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel, and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Again, we want to thank you for your support, and thanks for watching.